But here's where it gets real interesting. Let's read this. Page 94. Well, I just want to do everything right. I've lived my life in the wrong ways long enough. I, want, I just want to do what is right as far as God is concerned, he said. Jeff Dahmer speaking there. His second question was even more surprising than the first one. What translation of the Bible should I use? What translation do you use? He asked. Hmm. Again, I entered the discussion naively, not knowing that he, had, he already had a version in mind. I use the New International Version. Radcliffe speaking here, he says, I have studied the Greek and the Hebrew languages, and I've studied the different translations in terms of accuracy and readability. <laughs> yeah. It is very important that a translation is accurate, but it's equally important that the message be understandable in the clearest language possible. In the end, I finally settled on the New International Version. Check this out. By the look on his face, I could tell my answer did not sit well with him. Well, I use the King James Version, he said. Yeah, amen. Everything I've read tells me that this is the only reliable version of the Bible and that the Greek text that the King James translation is based on is superior to all other Greek texts. Why would you use any other translation? Don't you find, that the, don't you find the King James translation hard to read in places, I asked? You know, again, uh, you know, just got to stop there for a minute. You know, the philosophy of the new versionist is, well, the King James version is hard to understand in some places. It should be easy. Uh, no, there are some parts of Scripture that are hard to understand. Absolutely. Oh, but, but we mean the archaic language. Uh, well, if you do some study into it, I know that uh, there's a book out here. I should probably do a review of this thing sometime. Archaic Words in the Authorized Version. And there's a whole section in the back. This is uh, Lance, Lawrence, Lawrence Vance. And there's a whole section in the back here that he has... See if I can get to it. Um, where he actually compares the uh, NIV, yeah, archaic words in the NIV. Um, see if I can get this thing here. I'm trying to see. Yeah, here you have, uh, there you have the NIV right there. And down here, you can see that list. The uh, King James is over here on this side. If I can show that. There's the King James words. Here's the NIV words over here. Many, many, many places the NIV uses much more difficult to understand words. But these guys, these scammers like this Ratcliffe will come along and they'll say, it's just so hard to understand the King James Bible. And I know why they say that. Because of the same reason it was hard for me to understand the King James Bible before I got saved. I used an NIV for 15 years before I got saved. From the time I was 10 till the time I was 25 years old. Memorized quoted it and everything else in the Sunday school and everything growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the King James Version seemed foreign to me. You know why? Because it's Holy Spirit inspired. The NIV is not. I'm going to talk more about manuscript evidence here just as we, as we continue. But uh, ask him here if it's hard to understand. He says, well, Dahmer says, well, yes, but that's not the point. For me, the issue is accuracy. And I believe the King James is the most accurate Bible translation. Now look at the condescending thing here. I tried to proceed gently. Okay? Just stop right there again. I mean, this is, this is textbook, classic, Alexandrian textual, higher criticism. This is, this is perfect. Uh, where's the book? Okay? I had to proceed gently because I'm dealing with an idiot here. And it's just so important. Oop, grab the wrong one. This is actually Peter Ruckman's answer to James White. <laughs> Good book. But um, here you have James White's book. The silly little jerk that he is. James White, can you trust the modern translations? Look what he has up here at the top. 
This is the best book in print on an, excuse me here, on a topic too often riddled with emotion and ignorance. I'm trying to read it in the camera viewfinder thing there. Norman Geisler, he's a Jesuit, trained at two different Jesuit universities. Man, a trained Jesuit writes this thing here and James White puts it on his book. Hmm. You see the attitude of the uh, people that use the new versions and defend these new versions, claim to know Greek and Hebrew? Oh, well, I have to. Oh, you, you believe the King James Bible? Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh. I don't want to insult you, but let me just speak down to your level. Insanity. These people are Luciferian liars. And I'll demonstrate that in just a minute. He says here, well, there's a lot of debate on that issue. There certainly is. There are problems with the King James Version because so many of the English words have changed their meaning since that translation was made. Okay, another one of the classic attacks against the King James Bible. What do you mean, he asked. A number of words mean just the opposite today from what they meant in 1611. Now, watch, watch this little leap of, of sophistry here. One example is the word let. Paul uses it in Romans to say that he intended to come to them, but Satan let him. What he, meant, what he means is that Satan hindered him. This use of the word let is found today only in tennis. Wait a second here. I thought you just said up here, number of words mean just the opposite today from what they meant in 1611, but it's used today in tennis. Turn on the Wimbledon Cup on your television, and there it comes up, and, they go, and the ball hits the net, and they go, let, but it's archaic. Nobody knows what it means. See? Sophistry. Okay? Just again, a tactic of the Jesuits, and I, I'm not calling the guy a Jesuit, I don't know. But the whole point is a, a, a tactic that's taught. Jesuits teach it to these types of people, these Alexandrian perverts, and then they use it, and they'll say, oh, that word is passed out of common usage. See, it's, it's similar to what is used today in tennis. Well, then it didn't pass out of common usage, did it? Anybody home? Knock, knock, you know. It's used today in tennis, but it's passed out of common use. Okay. Yeah. Or you can just, you know, read the King James Bible, and when somebody says, what does it mean, let? You say, well, you know, like in tennis? Or some other quote-unquote archaic word, you just say, well, this is what they mean by that. You can see it in the context. That'd be too hard, I guess. Okay. Um, continuing here, he says, when a ball is stopped by the net is a let ball. Uh, today, the word has the meaning of to allow, not hinder. No, it doesn't. You just set it up there. The King James has many words like that, and I find myself spending half my time needing to redefine the words hmm, in order to understand the message. See? This is what the new versions do. Let's rewrite the Bible. As long as you don't change the message. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he said, but what about its accuracy? Check this out. Well, all Bible translations are based on Greek manuscripts. None go back to the original. All are copies, and most are copies of copies of copies. The oldest and most reliable, uh-oh, complete manuscripts date only to the 400 A.D. era. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Don't tell him that. Just tell him it's the oldest and most reliable. You know, nearly all of these were either not discovered at the time of the King James translation or were not available. Another lie. Let me just show you here real quickly. Right here, I have a Reims New Testament. This is an official one put out by the Catholic Church. The real deal, it's not the uh, Dewey Reims of the modern ones. That was actually changed to the Challoner Revision changed to read more like the King James Bible back in the 1800s. This is the real one from 1582, complete with notes written by Jesuits. Again, I'm not joking. This is a Jesuit translation. 1582. 1611. And most of these newer uh, updated readings that are in the NIV appear in here. They're right in there. But the translators of the King James Bible, they didn't have access to the uh, changes in the modern versions. Uh, 1582. 
and Erasmus, when asked if he had seen the uh, Vaticanus manuscript, he said, yeah, he was familiar with the readings of it. Got that in other books too. The readings were available. Of course they were available. But see, if you're a liar, like this Ratcliffe guy, and believing a lie, um, they're just going to, you know, repeat this stuff. And by the way, I just need to say this too. Right here I have the uh, Nestle's text, both the 27th and the 28th edition. I've showed this before. King James Bible is based on a different text, the received text, the Textus Receptus. This comes down through the Greek Orthodox system. This is from the Roman Catholic Church right here. Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini was on the board of editors of the Nestle's text. He's dead and frying in hell right now, uh, with which we can all be grateful. Very wicked man. But they tell you, they'll say, well, the NIV is accurate to the Greek. What they don't tell you is it's from the Nestle's. Sometimes you can see it if you look into some more of the writing and things. But the fact of the matter is, if you look into what Vaticanus and Sinaiticus contained, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus both contain apocryphal books, extra books that are not part of our King James Bible, as part of the inspired text. But wait a second, the NIV is the most accurate, or one of the most accurate, trusted translations. Well, if it was, it would include those extra books, but they don't include them. At least not yet. And the new versions are starting to include these deuterocanonical or apocryphal books. Again, I can prove that. I don't know if I have it here with me right now. Yeah. The New Reviled Standard Version. And there you can see, and it has the extra books. Hmm. Interesting. New version. Maybe that's why they also came out with... Uh, Another one here, see if I can find it quickly. How about the uh, Catholic Youth Bible? Right there. New Revised Standard Version. Right there. A uh, Protestant Bible. Catholic Bibles. That's what they are. But let's continue here. Okay. The Greek text the King James Bible is based on comes from newer, not older manuscripts. Most people consider the Greek text used for the King James Bible to be inferior, not superior to modern day Greek texts. Okay, let me just stop there again. Again, oh well, most people. Have you talked to everybody? You know, I don't think so. Most of these Bible colleges are totally, completely infiltrated by the Jesuits. Again, you know, this. I've been able to prove this stuff. In the past, you know, there are many, many, many you know accounts of this whole thing, and they say that the uh, the text that the King James is tran or you know translated from the Greek text right here, the received text, it's it's not as good and, and everything else. It's it's based on newer manuscripts. Well, let me say it this way: um, When was the last time you put together a Bible study from a two hundred year old King James Bible? What do you use when you do a Bible study? A more modern one? You know why? Because if a Bible is worth anything, it's going to wear out after a couple years. So these Texas Receptus manuscripts, they, most of them are newer editions and things like that. Why? Because they were using them. Unlike the Catholic Church that does not use the Bible. They just, oh, here's the Vaticanus, and they just stick it over on a shelf someplace and you know, or put it in a glass case or something enshrined in gold, you know, frame or something, and they come and they bow to it and pray to it or something like this. And by the way, over 99% of all extant Greek manuscripts, ones that are found, ones that have been looked at and collated and everything, over 99% line up with the Texas Receptus. Less than 1% line up with the Nestles, the changes made in the Nestles text. But he wasn't going to tell Jeff that. Because he's a liar. He's a lying snake. Look at this. Look at Jeff's reaction. Jeff was flabbergasted. This can't be. I have read all or I've read books that have assured me that the Greek text of the King James Bible is superior to all other Greek texts. Okay? 
Now, let me ask you another question here. Let me just break in here. Why was Jeff flabbergasted? You know why? Very simple. Let me read a verse of scripture from the King James Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Written scripture is what assures us of our salvation, not feelings. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Do you have God's holy word? For you new version people out there, can you hold up a book and say, this is God's perfect word, I'm not going to mess with it? Well, all translations have errors. Okay, then you can't be assured of your salvation. That's the whole issue here. That's why Jeff Dahmer was flabbergasted. That just, what? Because he realizes without a book that's God's word, without the perfect standard of God's word, he really has no assurance if he's going to go to heaven when he dies. He's right back into the world of evolution. And Alexandrian textual criticism is evolutionary in its philosophy. Think about it. Every new translation that comes out, we're going to get better and better and better. Not, hey, we came out with one in 1611, and the only changes that were made were some font changes and things like that, going from Gothic to Roman and, and some of the spelling changes and things, but it really hasn't changed that much since 1611. 1769 is when it was, okay, we got the text all fixed up and everything, done. Don't mess with it. Okay? You can read this book. I can read things written back. You know, I have a facsimile here over here, right there, of one of well, King James Bible in 1611, I can read the two together. Totally fine. Very, very few changes between the two. Again, printing changes and things and some spelling changes as the English language became, uh, you know, settled. I mean, English was still a new language in 1611. Again, a lot of people don't realize that. See? But this thing gives us an assurance of salvation. The new versions, they will tell you in the preface to the new versions. Again, watch some of my older videos. I show this. They will tell you in the preface that this translation is not perfect and it's going to continually need to be revised and updated and revised and updated. Just insane. And again, let's look at the uh, little condescending attitude here from Ratcliffe. Page 96, I decided to move on. <laughs> you know, it just makes me sick. Look, we're not going to settle this question here and now. We don't have the resources to get into this like we ought to. I propose that you use the King James Bible. Use what you prefer, you know. You obviously have a lot of confidence in it. I will continue to use my new international version. If there are disagreements, that I, and I doubt there will be many, we can compare them and decide as best uh, we can from what we have studied what is right. How does that sound? Again, as a new Christian, he's answering here. I guess that will be okay. He answered cautiously. And, you know, this is what he is reporting. This is what this guy right here is reporting. You know, I mean, for all we know, Dahmer could have told him off and said, you're a false prophet. You know, I don't even know if I want to talk to you again. But he just records this. And don't tell me for one minute that new version people don't lie. I've been around them. They will lie straight to your face. They're deceivers. Yeah, but again, you know, well, we'll have to study it. We'll look at it. We'll determine what's right. So it's man that gets to determine. Again, that is the main philosophy behind the new versions. It's not, thus saith the Lord, this is the standard, don't question it. Oh, no. Well, you see, actually, if you look at the Greek word here, there, you, another way of possible translation could be blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Continuing here, he says, Jeff, translation differences are usually over minor points. The main ideas and concepts of God are revealed in both translations. Liar. We'll gain by studying together. 
okay, I see your point. That will just have to be the way it is. Let's continue on here. Next page, we have page 97. So I began, I appreciate your question, but I think given your circumstances, you need to be around Christians and all who claim to be Christians. Why would a saved man give this advice to a new Christian? More than anything else, he says here. So I suggest that you simply attend every chapel and church service you can attend that is Christian in nature. You tell a, a guy that's just saved, especially one is in a fragile spiritual condition like Jeff Dahmer would have been, oh, as long as they profess to be Christians, just go be, you know, join yourself to them. Are you kidding me? Look what Jeff says in response. I can't believe you said that, he exclaimed. My father is real involved in the Church of Christ, and I know how much worshiping without instruments means to him. How can you say I should worship with every Christian group? Again, Dahmer's making the mistake of being a new Christian, and he looks and he goes, Church of Christ, I think, is the one. You know, but he, he has enough discernment from the Lord to say, how can you say that to me? You're supposed to be a pastor, and you're telling me to go in with a worship with a bunch of wolves and sheep's clothing? These people are wrong in their doctrine and stuff like this. What are you telling me to go in there and be part of them? See, a, a false convert is not going to have that discernment from the Lord. That's why I'm saying, after reviewing all the evidence, I believe Jeff Dahmer was saved. Yeah, he made some mistakes as a new Christian. All new Christians do, you know. But I believe he was a saved man after he went to jail and his conversion there. Continuing here, page 99. The question about the Bible translation would return a few times. <laughs> Jeff wanted to do the right thing. He had been on the wrong path long enough, and now he wanted to go where God was. Is this what a false convert would do? No. A false convert would uh, give in and say, well, I guess it is. the NIV is okay. I guess, you know, I guess I shouldn't make a big deal. It's divisive, and it's this, and it's that. Uh-uh. Jeff wouldn't let the Bible translation issue go. He believed that King James Bible, and he said, that's the book right there. Why? Because he was genuinely converted. That's such a weird thing when you think about it. How many people are going to get up there to heaven? And I think this is one of the reasons why God saved Jeff Dahmer. Get up there to heaven, and here comes the Pope. Pope Pius XII here... The Lord says, depart from me, cursed and everlasting fire. The Pope says, what, huh, what, what? I didn't make it? The Lord says, yeah, actually, I, I have a, a young man here. Uh, Jeff, step forward. Of course, Pius XII would have been dead before Dahmer was even born, but just bear with the analogy here. Uh, Jeff, step forward. Jeff Dahmer steps forward. Hi, you know, <laughs> it's going to be like, this is Jeff Dahmer here, Pope. And um, he was a sodomite cannibal and... Uh, a murderer and um, he came to me and I exchanged my perfect sinless life for his wicked vile life it's called imputed righteousness something the popes know nothing about and he switches and he says okay Jeff you're saved you're in and self-righteous Pope goes to hell and I believe this guy here too I believe his you know plan of salvation the baptism thing is false the fact that he's against the King James Bible, clearly against it, using the old Alexandrian party line that uh, is spewed by the Vatican. Not saved. Not saved. What a weird thing. Get up there to heaven, there's Dahmer in, and this guy's out. Irony. <laughs> Let's continue. Page 103. During each visit, he brought up another question that bothered him. Again, he's continuing to question things. He wants to know the Word of God. Uh, it says here, As I've mentioned, when a person in prison finds God, most of what they expect about God is expressed in terms of rule-keeping. They have been blatant rule-breakers, so their change to an opposite kind of life means they see, see God as the ultimate rule-keeper. He is. The judge of all the earth. The concept is rather simple. Leaving one kind of life for another means a big turnabout. It does. Hence keeping the rules instead of breaking them. Now look at this. This is what this Radcliffe guy says. Of course, this approach to faith is very legalistic in nature, and I am uncomfortable with a legalistic faith. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
you know, again, lost people, learn the standard operating procedure for lost people. Don't judge me when you bring up sins. Who are you to judge me? Are you perfect? Don't judge me. The Bible says, you know, judge not that you be not judged. You know, they'll do that. And then if that fails, they'll also say, you're legalistic. You know, meaning that you have standards that are in Scripture and you live by those standards. You know, and they'll try to say, well, you're adding that stuff to faith. Oh, uh, no. You know, faith is you come to Jesus or come to God and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know, and call upon his name to be saved. You know, the repentance and things that leads you to that. That's salvation. But when you get saved, there's going to be things that God tells you to do after that. You don't have to do those things to keep yourself saved. You do them because you have been saved in the past and now you're living for the Lord. And the Holy Spirit has moved in and is telling you what to do. That's the whole point. Page 110. What do you have to say about all this, I asked. You know, there are times I have longed for death, he confessed. I really don't want to go on living at times. But this experience has made me appreciate the life I now have. Some guy tried to kill uh, Dahmer in the chapel. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, just i got to just say that real quick here. Um, you know, here's talking about it here. You know, uh, I'm just going to say this. Dahmer takes the guy's advice and goes to the prison chapel meeting thing. And some Cuban guy tries to slit his throat by putting a razor blade, sticking it into a toothbrush and taping it on there, trying to cut his throat. So against his better judgment, Dahmer goes, I'm not going down there and being part of that. You know, why would you say that? I'm not going to go down and be with these people that profess to be Christians. But goes against it based on the advice of this hireling here. And he ends up going to the prison or going to the chapel. And the guy tries to kill him in the chapel. You know? But look at the reaction of Dahmer again here. Uh, this experience has made me appreciate the life I now have. I am so grateful to God that I have been spared. I praise God that I am alive. You are happy you were not hurt, I asked. Definitely, he responded. There is so much I want to do for God here in prison. So many people I want to share the gospel with. I want to talk to my mother about my faith. I can't imagine God taking these opportunities away from me now. I am so thankful that I survived. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Again, showing another aspect of a, of a Christian that follows the ministry of Paul. Paul's going, oh, I just wish I could die. You know, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. <laughs> you know, nevertheless, it's more needful that I abide here with you. I'm paraphrasing that a little bit, but Dahmer saying the same thing. That's why I believe he was saved. Genuinely born again. Here we have page 117. Jeff is very dedicated at the moment. He has even put study pamphlets in the prison chapel for other inmates to see. He's tracting. He's tracting. I mean, come on. Lionel didn't have to convince me of this, the importance of developing Jeff's faith. In my visits with him, I had seen Jeff's desire to spread the word among other inmates. Isn't that something? Again, I, you know, new Christians... It's just like all of a sudden you get saved, the Lord saves you, and you know, the Holy Spirit comes in and you go, okay, I got like a lot of questions about the Bible. I just, you can't put the Bible down. You're going, I got all these, oh, I just, I want to know about this and I want to know about that. And you make a dumb mistake and you go, oh, I can't believe I fell for that. That, But what's the truth? Oh, yeah, okay, I got that. That makes sense. And then it's just like, I got to do something to get the gospel out. All these other people, they don't, they're not saved. Man, I got to tell my mother and I got to tell my, my friends and my family. Oh, man, you know. These, these are not the things that happen when somebody's a false convert. That's what I'm saying. Page 120. I thought this was funny too. Was another thing about the Bible version issue. Sometimes when Jeff gets a thought in his mind, it is very difficult to get it corrected or changed. Yeah, I'm sure. I wanted Lionel, this is Jeff Dahmer's father, um, to know that I had worked enough with Jeff to understand some of his quirks, particularly his ability to set his mind on something and not let go. I had seen this in some of our discussions regarding the Bible translations and other issues. Once he had his mind made up, he didn't like to change it. 
Amen. He is very much like a sponge, trying to absorb as much as he possibly can. He wants to get his life right in every detail. Don't tell me that that's some guy just making a false profession of faith so he can get out of prison earlier. Dahmer knew he wasn't going to get out of prison. What's all this stuff about a changed life and everything? Oh, he wouldn't change on the King James Bible issue. You won't either if you're saved. I mean, you, you think you're going to take this book out of my hands? This book is what I'm holding on to for my faith. This book is everything to me. You think you're going to come along and convince me that it's, well, it has, does have some translation errors and it's really not God's Word. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. I live in this book. I read this book and it shocks me sometimes, and it will you too if you're saved. It'll shock you sometimes how accurate this book is to what's going on in your life. And you'll feel the Holy Spirit showing you things and teaching you things from this book. And you'll go, I wonder if the Bible teaches that. And then you'll turn on this ministry or on some other ministry and the guy, the preacher will say it exactly as what was in your mind. And you go, wow, whoa, I can't believe that. I've had brand new Christians come up to me and they say, hey, Brother Brian, did you ever think of the verse being said this way or that way? And they'll say some advanced thing in the scriptures and I go, yeah, it's exactly what the Bible, who told you that? I don't know, the thought just came to me the other day. The Holy Spirit. And some wicked devil comes along and they say, actually, let me speak down to you a little bit here. The King James Bible, I, I appreciate the fact that you use it. I really do. And I, I, you know, that's nice, but it's not God's perfect word. And you look at that and you go, uh-huh, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. You're not going to push me off of this, you know, Bible-believing stand. But let's continue. Page 126. What Jeff didn't understand was that Revelation, as well as Hebrews, is not so much about the end of the world as it is about faith. <laughs> That's what this Radcliffe guy says. Its theme and purpose is to encourage people to hang on to their faith no matter what happens or how dire their circumstances seem. What? <laughs> huh? You know? Oh, the, the book of Revelation is not so much about the end of the world. What's it about? A walk in the park? You know? These are not the words of a Christian. These are the words of somebody who, who makes a living preaching the Bible. Right there. Page 128. Yeah, I'm trying to make an arrangement with the publishing house to ship her some of the materials my dad has sent me. He continued. What sort of materials, I asked. All well, about the creation of the world and how evolution is untrue. He's talking about his mother here because their parents had, you know, his parents had been divorced. Um, that, look at this, creation of the world and how evolution is untrue. That's where I got my faith in God from those materials and I just know if she would look at them, she could get her faith back too, he explained. He got his faith in the Lord from the creation science materials. And again, I saw this cheap little opportunist, uh, Rudy Davis, uh, here on YouTube, and he's, you know, buddy-buddy with Ken Hovind. I read, read Ken Hovind's whole affidavit, read the part where Ken Hovind came out and said that he's ecumenical and everything. The purpose of creation science evangelism is ecumenical in nature. You know, he took a vow of poverty, just like Catholic priests do. And, um, you know, Rudy Davis, and he came out and he has got this video on YouTube, you know, Ken Hovind's materials led Jeff Dahmer to the Lord. No, they didn't. Institute for Creation Research. It wasn't Hovind. Whatever. Page 137. I wanted to pass on to Lionel something Jeff had told me about his faith. Jeff told me that his journey of faith began with some material you had sent him. He said he did not believe in God until he went through those materials. He credits you with giving him his Christian faith, I told him. So again, it was not, you know, I would say Jeff Dahmer was a total false convert if this is the guy right here that uh, led him to the Lord. All right. Um, if Jeff Dahmer was trusting in some Church of Christ baptism to get him saved, I'd say, nope, sorry. I don't care what profession he has. He's, it's false. 
not genuine conversion. But uh, he got it from Creation Science Materials, Institute for Creation Research. So, I do believe Jeff was a saved man. 147. But we come to focus not on the crimes he committed, but on the faith that changed his life. I know Jeff believed in God and trusted in Christ to save him. I baptized him, studied with him, and got to know his heart. He was truly sorry for the things he had done. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Page 150. He was ready to die. I was the one who was unprepared. It's kind of funny. I think he's actually speaking prophetically about himself. Right there. Dahmer is, was ready to die. He saved. And this guy right here is the one who's unprepared. He's church, trusting in his Church of Christ membership. Roy Ratcliffe, if he's out there, I don't think he's going to be watching this, but if he does, you're not saved. I can tell you that. If you don't believe the King James Bible, this is the record. This is the word that you're supposed to receive that will save your soul. You think that you can be saved without believing this book? You say, well, then people have to have the King James Bible in order to be saved. I didn't say that. You can understand what Jesus Christ did and you can get saved, but the Lord's going to lead you to that book right there. The Lord is not going to lead you to use a new version for your whole life. Not going to happen. So, let's see if there's anything else in here. I think we're pretty much done. You know, again, just read this part here, um, page 170. I would show him my Bible, his NIV. He could read right out of my Bible and I could read out of his. Um, I explained I could point out different things from our different translations. So again, you have this guy, um, this Ratcliffe guy, and he's trying to destroy Jeff Dahmer's belief, his faith in this King James Bible. And Dahmer wouldn't back down for one minute. That's not what lost people do, brethren. So at the end of this matter, what is the conclusion of the whole matter? There's probably people that skipped to this part here. So, <laughs> hi, welcome back. You know, um, but uh, what's the conclusion of the whole matter? Um, could Jeff Dahmer have been saved? Well, that depends on if he qualified for salvation. What's the qualification for salvation? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The old hymn says, The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives. You believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and you say, God, please save me. Come to Him in an act of faith because of your belief that His death, burial, and resurrection, the blood that He shed on the cross, can pay for your sins. And when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in. And you'll get that unquenchable desire for questions to be answered. And that desire to witness to other people. And the desire to confess Jesus Christ publicly and openly. Your life will change. It will change drastically. Jeff Dahmer had that changed life after his conversion. And those people out there that say, well, if he's going to be in heaven, I don't want to be there. They're speaking truth. They don't even realize it, but they're speaking the truth. Jeff Dahmer is in heaven. I feel confident enough to, after looking at the whole case, I feel confident enough to say that, yeah, he's in heaven. In spite of the fact that uh, a minister of Satan right there, Alexandrian cult member t preaching a false gospel, tried to sidetrack him, and Dahmer didn't listen. He wasn't counting on his baptism he said it was the creation science materials that gave me my faith in Jesus Christ. Hmm. How interesting. And how condemning to people that trust in themselves to be saved. So a very interesting study. I've been wanting to put something together on this thing of uh, Jeff Dahmer for a long time because it illustrates, it's the absolute perfect illustration of Self-righteous people versus sinners. Sinners with Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness. 
where Jesus Christ says, I'll take your sinful life and pay for it on the cross. But, you know, Lord, I have some good stuff I can add to that. Jesus says, I'm not interested in your good works and your good life and the fact that you're not a bad person. He didn't die for you if you're a good person. He died for sinners. Are you worse than Jeff Dahmer out there? Well, if you are, Jesus died for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what horrible things you've committed or thought or, or whatever else, He died for sinners. But you find this repugnant. How could you say that a man that's so sick and disgusting? I, I can't stand the thought of, of Jeff Dahmer being in heaven. Then go to hell. So what did you say? I said go to hell. Go to hell and burn. That's where good people go. Righteous, church-going people. They go to hell. But those of us that have come to the end of ourselves and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Boy, I sure don't deserve heaven. But if you'll save me, Lord, if you'll save me, my life is yours. Please, God, save me. You do that, He'll save you. Please do it today. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, just an incredible, incredible story when you think of how God can save someone even as wicked as Jeff Dahmer. So if you're not saved, I mean, if you're an atheist out there and stuff, I make fun of you and things like that because I'm trying to break through that, that wall of self-righteous pride. That's why I make fun of people. I don't hate anybody. I really honestly don't hate anybody. But I realize that so many people just put up the shield of self-righteousness and they say, I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. I'm not like Jeff Dahmer. I'm not like Jeff Dahmer. Well, you should be. Because then maybe your self-righteous pride could be broken and you could come to the Lord as a sinner in need of a Savior. I can't get to heaven on my own. I need Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, without this book telling me about Jesus Christ and telling me what He did on the cross, I'm never going to make it. <laughs> Time is running out. Time is running out. Again, understanding, you're not going to understand this as a lost person, but let me just explain something to you that hopefully you can get at least the concept of this. There are different dispensations in this King James Bible. Each one ends in things falling apart, and then a major event happens and brings in the next one. The last one that happened is you had the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets are until John the Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of heaven is preached, and every man presseth into it. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were preached. Two kingdoms. Physical and spiritual kingdom. Why? Because Jesus Christ the King was on the earth. Physically on the earth. The fullness of the Godhead was right there bodily. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in one body. Walking around on the earth. God was manifest in the flesh. Major event happened. He dies on the cross. Boom. Brings in the church age. The church age lasts for nearly 2,000 years, ends in apostasy. Why? Because God is refining things. He's making the distinction that much stronger. So you have people that are saved. Those that have truly been born again, there's a changed life, like we just read about right here in this book. Jeff Dahmer had a changed life. I've had a changed life. You've had a changed life if you're saved. You say, well, I haven't really experienced many changes and things like that. I, I don't think it's a problem to use the new versions, and I don't really see a problem with it. Mm -hmm. You're not saved. You're not saved. Get saved. Get it figured out quickly. And if you're an atheist, you look at this whole mess that is professing Christianity, it is a mess. It's a total mess. But you can break your pride, you see, and say, okay, God, if you're real, show me that you're real. This book is about revelation, spiritual revelation. God will show you things. You say, well, I, got, I think i got time. You have very little time left. This dispensation that is many call the church age is about to end. 
we're right at the be at, right at the end of it. Excuse me, not the beginning, right at the end of it. We're almost through, and the body of Christ is going to be leaving. A moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going up, and all of a sudden, you're going to see who the hypocrite Christians were. You're going to see the uh, the fakes that use the new versions. The fakes that believe baptism saves or that believe there is no repentance associated with salvation or all the other fake things. There's no prayer needed. All this other stuff. All of a sudden you're going to see those fakes. They're going to be right here on the earth. And those of us who are truly saved are gone. And then you're going to realize you missed your opportunity. Why don't you get saved now? Why don't you come to Jesus Christ and get saved today drop your pride you might not be as bad as jeff dahmer but you've done things you know you have and you're scared about having people find out let me tell you something the bible says there's going to come a day when your secrets are going to be judged by jesus christ in front of all the host of heaven everything you've ever done is going to come out share one more verse of scripture here with you before we close something that you need to think about brethren if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins the only way to have your sins your thoughts your wickedness hidden is to get under the blood of Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking. Okay? The only way is for you to get saved. And then your sins are washed away. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Not at baptism, but when you get saved. You can say spiritual baptism, you know, say it that way. But not going and getting dunked under the water and brought back up. If you're a false convert, Church of Christ, all that's going to do is just make you wet. Okay? That's not going to wash your sins away. Your faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that washes your sins away. That blood that He shed, your sins are washed away. You're made clean. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus at salvation. You better do it soon. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.